time to get uncomfortable. It's time to hurt and it's time to have pain. Yeah. You sit in your mom's basement and you worry about anxiety and depression. Well, why don't we kick you the f out into the hardest places of the world and let me know in the time that you're thinking about where you're going to get your next meal, how's your depression and anxiety now? But most people's lives are so easy and so soft that we are literally breeding that soft mentality. Yeah. Let's do it, my man. Okay. That was recording. <clears throat> okay. You ready? I'm ready. He's a successful entrepreneur, business owner, proud dad, and much more. My guest, Keaton the Muscle. <laughs> What's up, my man? Good, man. I'm chilling. Your house is beautiful, bro. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's a nice yeah. uh, nice little place to do a podcast. Yeah, bro. Especially with the Limitless sign uh -huh. back there. Yep. Bro, you got it. Yeah. So you've been through a lot. You got the muscle side. Then there's uh, the Keaton side. Yeah. The one that a lot of people feel like don't really notice because yeah. you know you're very big you're very loud and you got a lot going on it's sometimes easy to get lost in like who he really is i want to dive deep into the key inside the dark and the light anything that makes you you yeah i want to start with your dad passed away when you were 21 years old mm -hmm. how did that impact your life in the personal and the business side you know, that was, and I tell people this all the time, that was the most pivoting moment, I think, in my life, even to date, even, you know, with the birth of my children and the marriage to my wife and all the wonderful things that have happened to me, that was the most pivotal moment in my life. I was in a really, really good place in my life. I had just gotten back from being a Mormon missionary, mm. and I was in a, a really good high state of spirituality, yeah. and I was as prepared as I could have been for my father's death, but... Uh, <clears throat> When I, when I sat next to my father and pretty much held his hand while he passed away, I listened to a lot of things, regrets, you know, deathbed uh, sorrows and all of that. I realized really, really quickly that I was going to live and die by one saying. And it's something that I say a lot now because it was forged into my mind during my father's death. And it was... I would rather sink on my own ship than I would sell on somebody else's. Oof. And a lot of people think that that's a prideful thing. And, and they would say, that doesn't make any sense. Why wouldn't you just want to be successful or just sell on somebody else's ship? And the truth is, is I just don't work that way. My brain doesn't work that way. It doesn't allow me to do that. I wasn't able to jump through hoops. I wasn't able to work for somebody. I wasn't able to work under somebody or for somebody. I realized really quickly that I was either going to fail and fail and fail until I got it or I wasn't going to do it at all. Like Fuck, there was, yeah. there was no other like second choice or second piece to that. Yeah. I, I didn't have a backup plan of like, well, I can go work for somebody or I can go do something. And so realistically in my life, the most pivoting moment was that, that 21 year old me meeting with my dying father, listening to his stories, listening to the things that he had taught me. And a lot of what he had taught me was actually wrong. And he knew it was wrong at the end of his life. Yeah. And that was take the safe route, go to school, get an education, 401k, nine to five, college, you know, all that bullshit. Yeah, it's a bunch of bullshit. It's all bullshit. And when he sat on his deathbed and realized even to himself, that's not safe. It's not safe. There is no safety. There's nothing, yeah. And so when I realized that, I said, well, if there's no safety then I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want to do. Woo. And I made that decision from that time. And from that time until now, that's how I do things. People either love me or they hate me, and I'm okay with that. Who gives a fuck? No, I don't <laughs> care. Um, but the reality of it is I live the life that I want to live. Mm. I built it the way I wanted to build it. I've made a ton of mistakes, and I've learned from those mistakes. And both personally and in business, when I made the decision that I was going to sink on my own shit or I was not doing it, <laughs> I have. I have. There's yeah. been a lot of things I've done that if I would have done with somebody else, I probably would have been more successful in some, some mm -hmm. areas. You know, they say a man doesn't really become a man until his father dies. A hundred percent. When I hear your story, that hit me because yeah. that's incredible to me, man. I'm fortunate enough and very lucky that I that hasn't happened to me. Yeah. I don't have shit to be sad about. Yeah. The day is coming. The day that I'm really going to cry like a little bitch. Yeah. 
it's going to happen because my father is someone who has taught me so much. It has helped me become the man that I am. Yeah. So I see it and it's like incredible for me that you've been through that. Yeah. Right? What's the number one thing you think your father taught you? What's the most important thing he's taught you? Family over everything. That's what I got tattooed. Ooh, that's fucking dope, bro. Yeah. I need to get that one too somewhere. Yeah, have to. <laughs> a lot of people don't understand the amount of energy that takes to destroy your reality. Yeah. First of all, you come from a place where it's, you know, you've been in a mission and everything looks like cookie cutter. You know what I mean? Like everything is okay, the Lord and everything. And then boom, you get back. Where the fuck are you, God? Yeah. You took my father. Yeah. What I do now. Yeah. And I feel like that was a pivotal moment for you to just find your real self and become that man that, frankly, all of us men want to become. Yeah. In biblical times, it was called the patriarch. Ooh. And um, we all know that there's the patriarch of the family is always the leader of the family, the yes. male leader of the family. And I loved my dad, and he was a great man. I don't know if my dad was as good of a leader as I believed when I was younger, now mm. looking back. And it's one of the reasons why I think he did a 9 to 5 and while he was who he was. Yeah. But when he passed away, I actually understood what patriarch meant because I got that passed to me. Yeah. Not by choice. I was the oldest of five kids. My father was the patriarch of our home. And when he passed on, I took that mantle and I yeah. took it very, very seriously. And when I took that mantle, it was time for me to become a man. And, you know, I look back and I'm hard on the younger generations now because I think that there's a lot of bullshit out there. But I look back and dude, 21 to take on the mantle of being a patriarch of a family of five and a, and a mother, a distraught mother and, and all of that. It was a lot, dude. That's big. But I'll tell you that all of my successes to this day are because of the choices that I made to become that man that I needed to become that essentially I was forced into yeah. becoming, you know, and I, I'm thankful for it. Yeah. It's crazy. My dad died at 47 years old. That's only 11 That's years young. away from me. That's young. And, and it, it is young. But what I realized and what I was really grateful for is all the hard shit that he taught me to prepare Oof. me for when that time came. My father knew. He always knew. In fact, all of us knew he was going to die young. He was always sick. Yeah. But he prepared harshly sometimes. He prepared me to become that man and take that mantle. And although I've made millions and millions of mistakes, I feel proud of myself for the accomplishments that I've been able to obtain and be blessed with to be able to take that mantle and do very, very well with it. When I became the patriarch, I took that calling seriously. And it, you know, it bled into my own family. You know, yeah. I'm the patriarch of my family now. I'm still the patriarch of my my family. Like my siblings look to me, my mother still looks to me, all of them wonderful, respectively in their own elements. But I mean, this last year, I retired my mom. Woo. And that, uh, ding, 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 ding. Yeah, That's a huge it, it thing. It was a big deal. <laughs> I actually sat her right here in this room and, and I just said to her, you know, I know if dad was still here, he wouldn't have you working. Wow. And I know that when he passed on and he passed that mantle to me, that I want to be able to do that for you. And so I told her, I said, listen, I, there's, I don't need to give you cash, but here's a card and you use this however you want. You don't need to worry about how much money's on it. You don't need to worry about how much money you spend. From this time forward, you no longer have to worry. And it's that same exact thing I think my father would have done if he was still here, right? Yeah. You know, and, and I was able to do a lot of things like that. My youngest sibling, she's the only girl in the family. They bought their first house three years ago. Wow. And my mom called me and she said, hey, uh, your sister, she needs help for a down payment. Mm. And she said, I, I'm not going to ask you to do that, but I know that it's really important to you as the patriarch to help, yeah. you know? <laughs> and it wasn't a ton of money. I don't remember how much it was. It was 15 or 20 grand, but I, I wired it to her husband. I wow. didn't tell them. I didn't tell him. Bro. So I wired it to him and immediately they called me, you know, cause they, you know, you see when 15 <laughs> grand comes in your account yeah. or whatever it was. <laughs> Both just, you know, completely, completely thankful and, and everything. And she said, I, I don't know how we're going to pay you back, yada, yada, yada. And I said, listen, you don't owe me anything. When I took on that mantle of being the patriarch, I also took on the role of your father. And when he passed away, he handed that to me. So that mm -hmm. gift is to you from dad. It's not from me. Wow. And he's blessed my life to be that patriarch to give you those things and their gifts, their gifts that he would have given to you 
if he was still here. Wow. And so you don't owe me nothing. But things like that, I mean, that's that's what that meant. And it was such a pivoting moment and so ingrained in me that I worked and worked and worked to become who I am. You know, it's funny. I'm a big believer that the more you go through in life, the faster you mature, right? And I feel like the new generation is losing that. Yeah. They don't understand how beautiful it is to have fucking responsibility. Yeah. Like, Waking up in the morning and not having to think about it, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. You wake up and then, bro, sometimes I don't want to do shit. Yeah. But I know that my girl, I want her to be in the silkiest beds ever. Yeah. Yeah. I want my future kids to not have to worry about the shit that I worried about. I don't want that. Yeah. But that doesn't come overnight. It comes when something really fucked up happens to you. Yeah. And a lot of fucked up shit is not happening to younger kids. Yeah. It's that, it's that old saying... Hard times create hard men. Yes. Hard men create soft times, and soft times create soft men, and soft men create hard times. Yes, bro. You know, and and even Joe Rogan, he said we're in we're in soft times. We are, and it's creating soft men. Yeah. And you need to make a decision if you seek to become a hard man, which every man should. You gotta do hard shit, and yes. that's really hard right now because everything is so fucking soft. Bro, I just got a house right? Got a house. I spent a whole year just leaving it in the side. You know, I, 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 uh, I got another place that I stay at and I'm like, oh, I'm going to fix that. Nothing happened in a year. Yeah. Two months ago, I was like, what the fuck happened to you? I looked at myself in the mirror and I was like, you're disciplined. You care about things. You love your life and everybody around you. Why the fuck haven't you finished that house? Yeah. I've been in that house 24 seven almost, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right after work. You're in there working. Bro. I, so I wake up in the morning do my clips, yeah. put out the things that I need to put out. I go to work, come back, go to work on my house, and then still go home. Literally, I'm done like at 10 p.m. Yeah. Then from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., I'm working on my video, uh, like uh, on my yeah, video stuff. stuff. And then I only go to, go to sleep like three three hours or something like that. Yeah. And my girl's like, how the fuck do you do it? Yeah. And I'm like, I don't fucking know. I just have to do it. Yeah. I have this energy. I heard you talking about you don't drink coffee or anything yeah. or you don't drink energy drinks. Yeah, I don't do I don't caffeine. either, bro. And people, when I see people that drink energy drinks or caffeine or something to get them going, I'm like, oh, you don't have a purpose yet. Yeah. You don't know what your purpose is because when you find the purpose... That becomes your energy drink. I have a lot of assistants. Um, I, have, <laughs> I have three assistants, actually. And one of them, um, he's from Mexico. He's a good kid. And he works hard. He actually owns his own construction company, but he's here with me almost every day. Damn. He's always doing stuff all over the place. And listen, we both know the Mexican people are probably the hardest working people. <laughs> they just are. Like, hey, like we know that. You Latinos, know? Latinos. Yeah, you know yeah Latinos, whatever. <laughs> and dude, in all the business I've had, they're always my hardest working people. They really are. Well, dude, the other day, I had him with me uh -huh. from all, I had him with me all day because I had uh in fact when I gave my speech out in Salt Lake yeah you know we got up at six we went to the gym I went and gave my speech I came home I had a podcast then I had to film a TV <laughs> thing um, and then I had four meetings back to back to back and then I had to finish with a dinner mm. and then at the end of it I had one more meeting and then I had to spend time with my family Woo! well the most important thing yeah too. yeah well well at seven thirty eight o'clock at night. I came out of my last meeting. He was sitting um, in my living room um, and I could tell he was worn out. Yeah. And he goes, I don't know how the fuck you do it. And I said, what? I didn't know what he was talking about. I said, what? He goes, bro, everything you just did today takes people weeks and weeks and weeks to yes. do. And you're just going and going and going. And, you know, he's hearing me in meetings. He's hearing me like there's always energy. There's always like, uh, you know, the passion behind everything that I'm doing. He's like, bro, you turned it on from the time you woke <laughs> up and it's still on. At, we're going on eight o'clock at night. It's time to give it to your family. Like, and don't get me wrong. I like to spend time and just hang out with my yeah. family, right? They don't get crazy, crazy energy me, but whatever we're going to do, we're going to do it, right? Yeah. And he was like, I don't know how you do it, but it's very inspiring. And I said, listen, there's no secret here. Nothing, bro. You got to be able to love what you do. And when you truly love what you do there, you don't see time and energy anymore. Yeah. All you see is how much time do I have to get done what I want to get done. Facts, bro. You know? Oh, shit. It's funny how before I would work till 8 p.m. and I would get super tired. Yeah. But now that I have more responsibility, I work till 8 p.m. and I'm like... 
what else is there to do? Yeah. It's like, oh, let's take our dog out. Okay, yeah. cool. Let's take our dog out. Yeah. And then I can come down. Yeah. And then when we're done with that, I get back home and then we go harder. And my girl's like, can you go to sleep with me? Yeah. And I'm like, I can't because I'm working right now. Yeah. So then we can go to sleep in Malibu. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's yeah. a trade. My wife's funny. I, I've, I've made a very, very um, comfortable life for my children and my wife. <laughs> yeah. Very, very comfortable. You know, we just had our, our baby about two weeks ago. Yeah. And I hired a nurse that stays here and takes care of the baby uh, at night so we can sleep. I got an assistant for my wife that yeah. pretty much does everything she needs. I've got a nanny. I've got a chef. <sighs> and then I have my own assistant. And so literally, my wife, my children, their lives are very, very comfortable. Yes. Right? And so, you know, throughout the day, like I think even right now I shouldn't blast her, but I think she's upstairs sleeping with the baby right now, <laughs> taking a nap, you know? I finish my day 7, 8 o'clock at night, right? And the first thing I do, I jump out of this office. I'm like, let's go do something. Let's mm, go do something, right? That's important. And she's like, what are you doing? You've been going all day, and you're coming now to us saying, let's go do something. We all just want to hang out. And I'm like, no, let's go do something. Let's go enjoy, you know, our time. And the truth is, again, dude, until you truly feel mm. in your soul yes, whatever your purpose is, you will continue to look at the clock and wait until it runs out. Ooh, bro, I just got goosebumps. <laughs> God damn, bro. That's so true because you really don't have enough time. People yeah. understand. I heard you talking about how if you were able to look at a clock. An hourglass. Of, yes, an, hour, an hourglass of how much time you have to live. You would understand. Everything. Bro, and, and, and I think that happens from loss because, yeah. you know, I'm an ex-professional soccer player. I lost everything. Yeah. So nowadays, I'm like, I could lose everything. Yeah. I don't want to go through that shit again. No. So I have to put in 150%. Even when I don't want to, you still have to fucking put in work. You know, that's that's what I spoke on yesterday. Um, I said, I gave a saying. I told everybody to write it down. I said, true perspective breeds discipline mm. i actually put the post up and some people are like this guy's just saying words and i'm like no 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 break it down let me break it down for you real perspective is understanding what what time is mm. that's real perspective like i know i only have so much time on this earth i only have so much time with my children yes i only have so much time with my wife Someone once broke it down. I don't remember who it was. He said, how often do you see your parents? And the person he was speaking to said, I see them twice a year. And he goes, so if your parents live for 10 more years, you're going to see your parents 20 more times. <sighs> Bro. And in that perspective, if you actually keep that perspective, you become more disciplined in what you do pertaining to that. Yes. So whatever it is, dude, if, if, if somebody loses their spouse, they gain perspective they wish they would have had before they lost them. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. When someone loses something, they gain perspective of what they wish they would have had when they had it. Yeah. So true perspective breeds discipline to give us what we need to do in the moment we have it and need to do it. Yes. And it sucks, man. That's where people don't understand. We're all going to lay on our deathbed and look back and go, fuck. Damn. I wish I would have done something different with the time I was given. Oh, bro, I, I'm a big believer in God. Right. That's uh, when you even talk about being the son of God. Mm -hmm. Right. I got what I wanted in life when I was all about God. Yeah. But what happened when I started losing God? Yeah. Lost everything. You lost perspective. And lost then you perspective. And you stopped being disciplined to what it took to not lose everything. Yes. Yeah, so nowadays, bro, I'm like, I was disrespectful to God. He gave me everything. Yeah. And I said, ah, it's all good. I was spoiled. That's the reason why I work my ass off nowadays. Yeah. Because I cannot disrespect them again. Yeah. That would be the worst thing ever. Because I know what happens when you disrespect God. Yeah. I know what happens when you take his blessings for granted. Yeah. Exactly. And that perspective is what makes me look at life through a bird's eye view. Yeah. And now I'm like, I see you. Motherfucker, I thought you said you wanted to help your family. Yeah. But you're sitting down? Fuck you, bro. Yeah. I come from work and I'm tired, bro. Yeah. There's some hard days, right? And I'm sitting down and I'm looking and I'm like, it's like a little voice. It's like, motherfucker, you know you want that, but you're acting like a bitch right now. Yeah. Look at you just sitting down. Yeah. And then I, fuck it, I get up, right? Because yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know, um, we all have an inner bitch. Yeah. Have you heard about that? Oh, Joe yeah. Rogan talking about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. We all have an inner bitch 
that tries to win every day. When I had my event, I had David Goggins in here, and Ooh. that's what we were talking about. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. I said, why the fuck do you run so much, man? <laughs> and he said, it's because I don't want to listen to my inner bitch. Ooh. And, and he said, he, he told me, he said, dude, I'll tell you, every morning I get up and I sit at the end of my bed for about 20 minutes. <laughs> and he's like, I listen to that inner bitch, and that inner bitch just gets me shaking my head. Like, mm. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And he's like, I let him, I let him in for a minute. Then I dictate the rest of my day according to what I don't want to be, which is that inner bitch. Mm. And so he says, I listen to it, and then I go to work, you yes. know, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. You know, you talk about perspective, and we go back to the why do Latinos work so hard? <laughs> well, dude, have you been to Mexico? Yes. Like, that's a third world country. Yes. And when they grow up with what they grow up in, they in turn keep a perspective of this is what life can be. Yes. And here I am now, and life is so much better. So this work that's so hard, that's a small price to pay. I don't want to go back to that. Bro, I don't really talk about this because this is my real self. Yeah. But I used to wipe my ass with rocks in El Salvador. Yeah. I was that poor. Yeah. When I came here, toilet paper was like, what the fuck? Exactly. What the fuck? Like, you got to work? That's a given. Uh, dude, it, it, That's it, life. It, it's a blessing. And do you know yes. how many people are saying, I have nothing, and they got toilet paper and a toilet <laughs> to shit in? Yeah. Uh, we, we got people saying, I, I'm yeah. homeless, and they got fucking cell phones. Fucking crazy, bro. Bro, you have no idea. That's not real perspective. It's not. You want me to drop you off somewhere in El Salvador Please and tell do. me what, what it's like to be there? Then yes. you gain true perspective. One of the greatest things, I think, for people especially those who are in a very comfortable situation is get the fuck out of your area. Yes. Go travel the world. Go see what we have here. All of this in nice little beautiful Utah is so much greater than what 90% of the world has. Bro. And you should keep your perspective that what you have, you should be grateful for, but you don't want to lose it. So you should fucking work like a savage to keep it. And I want to go into that savage mode right? You have this savage mode that it only comes from a dark place. And that's the thing that a lot of men don't have is that ability. Can you turn it on in a moment of need? Yeah. You're a fucking savage, right? Yeah. But at the same time, you are so soft because you have a beautiful family. Yeah. You have six women now that you have to take care of. Yeah. One of the most amazing contrasts ever, bro. I want to be a daughter-only father yeah. because of that. You know what I mean? I want to be able to, bro, there's some times that I'm working at the house and some shit doesn't go right. Yeah. And I'm fucking beating the fuck out of shit. And yeah. I don't know why I'm doing it, right? Yeah. I'm just beating it. And then I, whew, I come down and I'm like, okay, you let it out. Now my girl comes and I just hug her. Yeah. Because that women energy does help you to just calm the fuck down. Yeah. Because if I didn't have my girlfriend, I would have probably killed somebody already. Yeah, yeah. It's too much energy. Yeah. But that contrast is what makes you you, bro. Well, and the truth um, is life is all about relations. Yes. And what I mean by that is I only know what true happiness is in relation to true pain. Mm. I only know what anything is according to the relation to what the opposite is. Yes. I only know happiness because I know sadness. I only know true peace because I know true war. And when you talk about becoming a savage, you literally have to go to both ends of the spectrum, right? Yes. The person in the room that wants the most peace is the one who has been at war the most. Ooh. You know, you talk about some of those military men that come back after they fought and they have seen crazy, crazy things. Yes, the most dangerous men in the world are usually the most peaceful because they have seen the opposite end and they seek to be on the other end of that spectrum, yes. right? And then on the same thing, and we all know this, but the dog that barks the loudest is usually <laughs> the one with the smallest bite, yeah. you know? And so and so for, for me... If I truly, truly seek peace, I must also understand that I have to be a savage. I have to be an animal. I have to be a warrior. Yeah. And the more I understand that life is relation to, then I soak up the hard times because the hard times teach me what the good times are. Yes. And the same exact thing over and over throughout life. People who tell me I'm sad and I'm depressed <laughs> and they haven't had hard shit hit them. Oh. 
What that means to me is it's time to get uncomfortable. It's time to hurt and it's time to have pain. Yeah. You sit in your mom's basement and you worry about anxiety and depression. Well, why don't we kick you the fuck out into the hardest places of the world and let me know in the time that you're thinking about where you're going to get your next meal, how's your depression and anxiety now? But most people's lives are so easy and so soft that we are literally breeding that soft mentality. Now, listen, I'm not here to say there isn't mental illness. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that a cure for most of it is actionable things that teach you how to gain true perspective pertaining to whatever the hell it is in your life. I got, and I won't say his name. I have a family member. Um, he always tells me how hard his day is. Like, oh, man, I'm just having a hard day. God. The, the motherfucker's 24 years old. He lives in mom and dad's basement. And he doesn't have a job. Oh, my God. His mom and dad are multimillionaires. He has nothing going on. He plays Fortnite all day long. <laughs> yeah. And I think to myself, you know what? If your life was fucking miserably hard, all of your sadness you're feeling right now would go away. Yes. And then with the relations of understanding that you are on the opposite end of where you're at, you would begin to find so much joy and happiness in where you actually are in the moment. Yes. You know, when I see people, I'm struggling so much. And I'm like, have you ever lost a child? Mm. Oh, my day's so hard. Well, what's so hard? Well, I only make 50 grand a year. (laughs) Do you know people don't make 50 grand in a lifetime? facts bro. you know and again it goes back to what i kind of started this conversation with and that's perspective mm-hmm. true perspective breeds discipline if you can gain a, a perspective in your life and and find respect for what is reality then you will be disciplined as a savage to wanting to have the the other end of it yes right and everybody else in the middle they never they never really get to experience either They They never get to have joy because they never had real pain. And the most beautiful, beautiful thing that God set up on this earth was he gave us relations. He gave us the opposites. Mm. Let me first allow you to see pain and sorrow so that you can understand true happiness and true peace. Mm. And that's how you actually find everything you want in this life. Yeah. When I had nothing... It taught me that when I now have everything, to find nothing but gratitude in every single thing that I have, because I know what it's like to have nothing. (laughs) When I was 21 years old and my dad died, and you know, a lot of people, because I was pretty successful fairly quickly because I was so disciplined in making money. When my dad died, everybody was like, oh, well, your dad must have had some kind of will that gave you money. Dude, I had $125 in my bank account when my dad died at 21 years old. When he died because he was so sick, the tiny little will he had went to paying off bills. That was it. He gave the house to my mom, obviously, and that was it. And she took that house and she bought another house and that was it. There was no more money to be had. I never had any money. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say I I grew up in El Salvador. I'm not going to say that my life was hard because it wasn't. But what I do know is what I have today is a huge contrast to what I once had. And that has allowed me to remain in that perspective. It's allowed me to stay disciplined to what it takes to stay right the fuck here. Yes. Which is being a savage in my disciplines that keep me successful. Yeah. Well, bro, it's all about the threshold, right? Yeah. I believe that if a kid who just started his career as an entrepreneur, right? went through what you go through on the daily, he would probably pass out. Yeah. He would throw up everywhere. <laughs> you know he what would saying? definitely be worn the fuck out by three <laughs> yeah. o'clock. I can tell you that. But there's levels to this shit. Yeah. I, I can't, you know, uh, I don't know if it was you or somebody else that was talking about belief, mm-hmm. right? We were, uh, somebody was talking about belief and then somebody said trust. And right now, if I look at myself, how much I work, because, you know, there, there's a version of you that nobody sees by yourself in a room yeah. late at night thinking of what you're doing, right? Yeah. Do you trust that version? Yeah. Because if you work your ass off, bro, you work so hard that you're tired. Sometimes you fall asleep and you don't even notice you fall asleep. If you trust that self, then you're going to become. Yeah. Fuck believe. Yeah. I could believe that I'm the greatest person ever any day, but do I trust myself that I can become the greatest person? I always used to ask people, would you rather be trusted or loved by God? Mm. And everybody always says, well, I want to be loved by God. And I say, well, God loves everybody. (laughs) But he doesn't trust everybody. Yes. He doesn't. Yes. I would rather that people around me trust me Mm. more than they love me. 
I would rather trust myself than I would love myself. Bro. Now, the cool thing is, is that when you do trust yourself, love just comes. It just comes with but, it. Dude, I'll tell you where my confidence comes from and why I build it and why I focus. You know, I mentor, right? Limitless yeah. Society is about mentoring people. And I tell people that confidence is everything. The reality is, is if you want to find true confidence, you got to begin to trust yourself. Yes. If you put me in any situation, I trust with 100%. I can handle any situation. It doesn't matter what it is. Mm. I trust it. I could yeah. step back from this person and look at myself and go, that motherfucker's got it. Yeah. I trust wherever you put him, he'll handle what he needs to handle. Yes. And most people can't say that. They can't. They can't step away from themselves and say, I don't trust that I'm going to do what I need to do to make <laughs> correct decisions and do the right actions. So I lack confidence, <laughs> yeah. right? And that's why it's it's kind of this like little circle thing. I don't trust myself, so I don't love myself. I don't love myself, so I don't trust myself. And it's just this downward cycle, whereas it's the opposite end. The second you begin to trust yourself because you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you yes. love yourself more. And the more you love yourself, the more you trust yourself. And it's an upward cycle. I always tell people all the time, there's no buoyancy in life. You're either going up or you're going down. You Facts. never stay the same. So when people say to me, nah, nah, it's all kind of been the same. The fuck it has. <laughs> yeah. You've been going down and you don't know you're going down. Yeah. You're either growing and progressing or you're dying. There's no in between. And so when you kind of label all of these things out, they all sound great. But the question is, is like, well, how do I begin to trust myself? How do I love myself? Mm. The answer is easy by word and hard by deed. And it's simple. It's you must do what you say you're going to do. I feel like there's a misconception with love because I love what I do, but I don't always want to do it. Yeah. Right. I love my girl, but sometimes we go through struggle. Yeah. We're in a generation where everybody wants to do what they love and what feels good. Yeah. Motherfucker, things are not going to feel good 100% of the time. Yeah. Because you love it, it just makes the ride a little soother. Yeah. Just because you love it doesn't mean you're going to be successful. No. It just means that in the hard days, you're going to be like, God, fuck. Okay, fine. Let me just keep going. Well, you know, there's a, there's a simple solution to that, again, by word and not by deed. If you learn to love the struggle, that's when you truly become successful. Yes. Um, I don't always love what I'm doing, but I tell you what I do love, and I, 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 neuro, I reluctantly say this. I love the struggle. Yeah. Dude, I'm so grateful for the struggle because the struggle is, as I've embraced it and learned to love it, it's what makes me better. And so when I go through things and I'm just out there saying, well, I love it. That's why I do it. The fuck I do. <laughs> yeah. I do it because I love the struggle. And even during the struggle, I enjoy it. I step back in a struggle and go, hey, this is what you signed up for. <laughs> yeah. This is what you're doing, and this is what's going to make you a better person. So when things come, and they come all the time, instead of running away and going, well, I love doing this, but I don't love this struggle, well, then you don't truly love it. Yes. And when you find that, it, it changes everything. I feel like people believe that there's this utopia that if you just work hard, you bust your ass off, you're going to get to a place where you're finally just chilling. Yeah. And I'm like, motherfucker, the harder you work, the harder it gets. Yeah. You just keep pushing the limit. Yeah. And not everybody can get to those limits. No. The concept of ending up in an island makes no sense to me. Yeah. Right? Everybody works so hard to one day they can just chill in an island doing nothing. And I'm yeah. like, give it two weeks. And I'm like, what the fuck is everybody doing? Yeah. Like, what the fuck do I want to do this for? Yeah. They asked somebody, that they said, why do you work so hard? Right? Like, you could just go to an island and chill. Yeah. And he said, because I'm not you. Yeah. That's why. Because wanting that end game is what is stopping you from becoming the greater self. One of the most beautiful uh, things I ever heard, one of my favorite people to listen to is Alan Watts. Mm. And he said, life is a hoax. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, let's hear, what do you have to say? And he said, you know, you're born and then you kind of prepare to go to school. Yeah. And then in kindergarten, you prepare for first grade. And in first grade, you prepare for second. In second grade, you prepare for fourth and fifth. And then in junior high, you prepare for high school. And then in college, you prepare for your career. And then you get to your career and you prepare to have a better career. And then you prepare to be the highest in your career. Yeah. And then at some point, he said, 40 to 45 years old, you turn around and you go, this whole thing has been a hoax. God damn. I'm not preparing for anything. <laughs> This yeah. has always been the journey, and this was the whole route. This was it. There was no preparation. I was always living, and it was always the journey. Yes. There is no end game. The end game is death. 
Yeah. The end game is, is that when this life is over and I have all of the opportunities to have the things of growth, which is experience. Yes. Then I turn around and I go, well, I just want more experience. And then he <laughs> finishes that conversation and I love it. He goes, if you could have everything you ever wanted, if you could dream it up and have it. He said, the first day you would dream of an island and you would dream of a boat and you would dream of a plane. And then after a little while, you'd begin to dream of more things and more things. And then really quickly, you would be tired yes. of having everything you dreamed of. And then he says, you would go into, well, I just want adventure. So with adventure comes uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So now I just want to dream about uncertain situations. And he said, and then you would get to this place somewhere down that line of succession where your dream would be sitting right here, right now. Ooh. That's my dream is to be right here, right now. In the present. In the present. I believe that if you were to look back at your 20-year-old self, you'll be proud of him, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because he did everything he needed to. Absolutely. We are time travelers. We just don't know it yet. Yeah. You're looking at your younger self every single day mm -hmm. without him knowing. Absolutely. My younger self didn't make me proud. Yeah. Every day I'm like, fuck, dude. You didn't stand on business for us. Yeah. So what I know now is that my 40-year-old self is looking at myself every single day, right? Yeah. And it's telling me, motherfucker, what are you doing? Get up. I am working to make my 40-year-old self proud. You know what's cool is uh, Matthew McConaughey said, uh, um, somebody said, who do you look to, uh, you know, for advice? <laughs> yeah. Who do you look to? Like, And he goes, well, I look to my, f my future self. Yes, dude. Oh my you know? And, um, and that's, that's me too, dude. Yeah. Like sometimes I'll get up in the morning and I'm like, nah, 40 year old Keaton <laughs> needs me to do this right now. So that when he's 40, he's doing what he wants to do. Yes. And I aspire to be him. And so I must do what it takes to become him. Mm, bro. Keaton, I know you have a limited time, but I feel like we're going to have future amazing conversations. Your energy is fucking vibrant. And you have so much to give to this world, bro. And um, I'm thankful that you gave me the time to even just speak to me. Because I know it's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> but one last question. Yeah. If you could go back in time to a younger Keaton, what would you tell him? I would look him in his eyes and I would tell him, keep doing what you think you need to do. Mm. Don't worry about what other people say. Don't worry about what they think. What you have in your heart and in your mind is right, I promise. And you're going to second guess it all the way up until you yeah. turn about 32. <laughs> but do not, do not for a second question every single decision you make. Wow. I have zero regrets, zero. Um, and I'm really, really grateful for 20-year-old Keaton. Fuck yeah. Because he got me to 35 year old Keaton and 35 year old Keaton's fucking crushing and Whew. really, really fucking happy. Yeah. And if I could go back to him, I would say, listen, I'm not going to give you any advice. I'm not going to tell you the secrets. I'm not going to tell you nothing. I'm going to tell you that what's in your heart, you fucking chase and yes. do not let anybody knock you off and don't listen to anybody else. Mm. Just fucking do what you're going to do. Fuck dude. That's amazing, bro. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. It's an honor, man. Hell yeah, bro. And to you guys, you could have been anywhere else in the world, but you right here with us right now with the muscle <laughs> and your host, Macon. Keaton, I'm on a mission. I'm working hard. I'm pushing myself because someday I want to have Post Malone on the show. Okay. Someday. Yeah, yeah. And I know it's hard, but it's a journey. Yeah, yeah. The fact that someday I want to have him in front of me yeah. and have everybody who was involved in the show in the audience yeah. and look in his eyes and tell him, I told every one of these guys that I you were going to be here. Yeah. I'm going to record manifestation in real time. Yeah. Because that. manifestation is not about talking. No. It's about doing right now. Yeah. And I think it's possible, bro. Well, let me tell you something. I promise you that will happen. Ooh, oh God damn. You heard it here, folks. It'll happen. Uh, <laughs> manifestation is a real thing. Mm. He'll most likely be at my event, Ooh. Um, which I'm excited for, for April 27th. We oh, the, shit. April 27th. Lim Melissa cool. Arena. Yeah, we haven't announced it, but by the time you put this podcast out, oh, it'll be out. Um, let's go. I actually just spoke to him and his team yesterday, so we're, we're working a deal to try to get him there. And uh, he, He's actually been a friend of mine. We've spoke quite a bit, and good dude. So wow. it, it'll happen. Just keep doing it. Damn, keep putting bro. it out there. You know what's funny? Every single episode, 
something kind of works out. Yeah. Like everyone is like, they either have a tattoo or they know the bodyguard yeah. or something, right? Yeah. And I'm like, fuck, I'm getting closer and closer and I'm fucking destroying reality because that's what people don't understand. Yeah. If you want to become someone big, destroying reality, it's a skill that you yeah. need to have. It's not easy to literally destroy particles that made you who you are. Yeah. You have to break them down. Yeah. That's why you have to go through struggle. That's why you got to get hurt. Yep. So, yeah, bro. And one more thing. I've been saying this since the beginning of time, since the beginning of the show. With my heart, bro, there's so much going on and people don't stop. But guys, please, from the bottom of my heart, stop cheating, man. There's a lot of cheating going on, Keaton. Yeah, there is. There's a, there is. I don't know what's going on, bro. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of people ask me like, oh, are you talking about cheating on your girlfriend, right? And I'm like, no. Cheating in everything. And everything, bro. Stop yeah. cheating on yourself. Yeah. That's a big one. Yeah. People just cheating left and right on their girlfriend, on themselves, on their career, on yeah. their dreams. What happens when you cheat? You lose everything, bro. Yeah. And I've been through that. Yeah. That's why I'm a big believer because I could have fucked up the happiness that I now have. Yeah. From one dumbass mistake, I could have fucked it all up. Yeah. Now I look at my girl and I'm like, Damn. Now I look at my life and I'm like, damn. Now I look at my career and I'm like, damn. Yeah. Because I'm happy. Yeah, bro. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. From the motto of my heart, bro. I'll, Thank I'll, you. Honored to be here. What do you got to tell the people? Where can they find you? Uh, you can find me, find me on Instagram. That's where I answer all my messages. Mm. Um, I answer everybody that messages me and it's usually me that's answering the period muscle on Instagram. And then if, uh, if you want to jump in limitless which is really what i promote the most mm -hmm. is, is teaching what we've talked about today um it's limitless society.com simple Ooh. shit hell yeah bro and that's a beautiful group you got going on Thank there you. you know i feel like the usual school is dying you know men women everybody needs a different way of learning yeah and that's not being taught in school yeah places like limit society is the place that you will learn things that nowadays you need yeah you know, so I'm happy for that, bro. That's yeah. going to become the biggest school. And we know there's schools out there, but I believe this is going to become the biggest school ever, bro. It will. I'll, 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 I'll tell you, Manifestation, you can roll this back in <laughs> two or three years. It'll be bigger than anything else. That's what I'm talking about. But thank you, bro. Absolutely. Really. Love you guys. Go to sleep early and drink water, please. Right? Okay. Absolutely. People are not drinking water. See, he's drinking water. While we talk, that's all I drink. I don't drink anything else. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. So love you guys. Peace out. <laughs> You're not going to say bye? Oh, bye. <laughs> <laughs>